Hello, everyone. How do you like our music? There's a guy named Gordon Bach, B-O-K, who I used to listen to when I lived in Maine. So I, so I got one of his albums. Thank. Anyway, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Penny Wright. I know many of you. Um, some of you may know that last summer we had a program with Pat Mondes about her life as a sea captain. And we just loved her. We really loved her. We loved her talk. And I said, please come back. You can talk about whatever you want. So she said, I'll just talk about my adventures, you know, on various different boats. And we'll no shortage of wives. No shortage of wives. <laughs> so here she is. For those of you who don't know about Pat, uh, Pat was born and raised in Montauk, and she is a graduate of the New York Maritime Academy. Her career includes serving as seagoing ship's deck officer on board international trading BLCC oil tankers, operation integrity specialist and technical writer with the Sea River Maritimes International Quality Management System, and the U.S. Coast Guard chief mate. Retiring in the late 1990s, Pat has worn many more hats since then. As a freelance journalist and writer, a boat restorer, and proprietor of East End Charters, which, believe me, is keeping her quite busy, so we're really happy to have her tonight. In addition, from 2010, uh, for a year, she served as the executive director of the Shelter Island Historical Society. We're so grateful, Pat, for you being here tonight. Please welcome Pat Munns. Thank you, everybody, for coming out on such a beautiful day. It seems weird to come to a park in the afternoon, but um, <clears throat> we talked about, since I was here last year, we talked about uh, a lot of Penny and I was like, well, what do you do in your off time? And I, I came up with the idea of doing a talk on the different travels that I did on boats, with boats, loving boats, between ships. I mean, some people go on holiday, they go on a cooking tour, a wine tour. Well, I didn't do it on purpose, but it seems like my whole life was everywhere I went, I explored boats. <clears throat> so I wanted to start out with this funny little painting, which, uh, was done by my five-year-old nephew last year. He came to visit and he said, Aunt Pat, you know, you have so many fun things to do on boats. This is what I would want to do. If I, was, if I lived here, this would be me. That's, his name is Benjamin. That's what the B on his hat is for. You can see he's... <laughs> I like the little, like, stance. And, you know, he's a pretty happy little thing. I thought it was charming. Um... I grew up in Montauk, <clears throat> and it's a pretty fishy place, actually. Does this, does this mean something? Oh my goodness. Yeah, I don't know. I promise I won't touch anything. <laughs> So this is my father's boat slip facing east first thing in the morning. And <clears throat> I, to tell you the truth, I don't really ever remember not being on boats. I think I got dragged along when I was a little kid and it just kind of grew on me. That's me, the little guy on the right. <laughs> uh, you know, that he, it's probably, I'm guessing, I, I'm 62 years old, I'm probably four or five there, so I'm guessing that would be about 1962 or so. But wherever my father went, I was his sidekick and I went along, and everything involved boats. So that's kind of where the boat bump came from. And I also lived on the ocean uh, in Montauk. And those bonnikers were, you know, set in hall scenes pretty much every day or every other day, so. Without even really knowing it, I just had uh, I just had an eye for boats, and it was you know pretty much the only thing I was really very good at. So I just followed my gut instinct. Uh, I left Montauk in 1974 because I met the guy that owned this boat, and he 
you know, he was the handsomest devil I ever met. I was only 17, and I'm like, oh, I want to go sailing. And when I told my father that I wanted to leave Montauk to work on sailboats, he nearly threw me out of the house. Uh, he, he said sailing was for seagoing tourists. But I'm like, but Daddy, I want to work on these boats. I want to make it my life. And like I said, I was only 17, so I just bought a plane ticket to the, to the Caribbean and lived that life. I, I worked on charter boats and lived in the Caribbean in the winter. And then I'd catch another boat and sail home. Uh, I worked at Gosman's to make enough money to subsidize the sailing habit because back in the <coughs> early 70s, I think I was only making maybe 35 or $40 a week working on sailboats. But I, I learned a lot. Uh, but after a while, you know, there's only so many sunsets and palm trees and margaritas you can, you know, consume. And I happened to be on my way back. I was in Bermuda and I met somebody at the bar. He said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm working on that sailboat over there. And I, I was only 19 years old. I, he said, how do you like it? And I, I didn't even, I wasn't even old enough to understand what I was complaining about, but I said, Really, I like being at sea. I like being out on the ocean. I like standing watch. I like mm. being around all the critters. I just love the whole life. But whenever anything difficult comes up, they stick me on the wheel and they teach somebody else how to solve the problem. I said, I feel like I'm not learning anymore. And at first, I was complaining about the lack of mentoring, and I didn't even know it. And he said to me, he goes, Well, now they're just starting to take women at the maritime academies. And of course, I, I was too. I didn't even know what a maritime academy was. It, it never occurred to me that people work on ships. They're just something dangerous on the horizon that you stay away from, you know. So, uh, turns out he was a captain for mobile, and he uh, he set me straight. And if I hadn't met that fellow in, on that one particular afternoon, in my life probably probably would be working on sailboats. Uh, the irony is here. <laughs> here I'm back now working on sailboats again. <laughs> So I did come home, I, I sailed the boat the rest of the way back, got, got off, started exploring and um, found out that Fort Schuyler was a pretty cool place. Uh, you could come home on weekends, but it still was a military school. You had to wear a uniform and as you can see, I brought a little bit of Caribbean with me. That's my version of a military school, but uh, that's really the big picture. And I, I, I was there for a year, and I started having second thoughts about it. I'm like, God, I, you know, lots of American flags and saluting and Pershing rifles and marching and shiny shoes. I wasn't really sure whether I wanted that to be my life. Uh, so I took off with a bunch of friends of mine who had uh, this great 45-foot boat, and we cruised to Labrador, Nova Scotia, uh, through the Bredore Lakes, across the Cabot Straits to Newfoundland, and then all, all, as far up in Labrador as we could go, we started running into ice and we decided to come back. But it was a cool trip. It was myself and five hairy guys. <laughs> and we, there's nothing up there except fishing places. Um, they process codfish, they salt them, and that's pretty much all they do. They cure hides and they salt codfish for export. So the boat we were on didn't have anything. It didn't have radar, it didn't have an anchor windlass, it didn't have any electricity. I mean, it was about as close to nature as you could possibly get. But it was a cool trip. And then I went back. <clears throat> because after that summer of introspection, I realized, all right, well, nothing comes for free. I don't really want to be a waitress or a boat girl the rest of my life. So I went back to school and finished. Uh, we did have a great sailing team. We had a crew team. But you know there were only 11 girls in my class. So that was kind of a struggle to figure out how to fit in. Uh, you know, they, we hardly even had enough girls to make a team. And then this is my first ship, which I was cadet observer on. The way the maritime system works, you have to do sea time as an observer to prove to the Coast Guard that you've had practical experience on board. So 
because I had not gone on my first cruise ship, uh, training ship, uh, summer cruise, I had to make up for it on this ship. And it was horrible. The guy, the captain was from Alabama and he was a real jerk. He, uh, first thing he said to me, I went to his office and, you know, I was all dressed up in my little outfit like I was supposed to. And, I had my letter of recommendation, and he, he just like shoved my letter off to the side. He said, I don't like blacks, and I don't like goddamn women. He said, the only reason you're here is a company sent you here. He wouldn't even talk to me. And by the end of my three weeks on board, I had all these black and blue marks on my arms because he gripped me and shook me, you know. <laughs> Pretty horrible. That was my first ship. His name was Blackie Gristo. And he smelled bad, too. <laughs> so my first ship, uh, what, I was in Alaska, and you know the run, is, that was when the Alaska pipeline coming from the Bering Sea was in full bore. Uh, they had probably eight or nine ships a day loading oil, bringing it to San Francisco and LA. And then I kept, my, I, I met a really wonderful man who, uh, was willing to be married to a lady sailor who was gone for two or three months at a time. And we bought this wonderful little 28-foot double-ender. It's a Hairshoff, El Francis Hairshoff. It's only six feet wide, 28 feet long, no engine. And it was the perfect antidote for these giant big ships with computers and all kinds of high-tech stuff. So we sailed that little boat everywhere, he and I. And it was a pure joy. It was really it was a wonderful, wonderful book. So the thing is about working on ships, officers anyway, for every day that I was on board a ship, I got one day of paid vacation. So that was perfect for my nature. I'd stay on a ship for three months, then come home with 90 days of paid vacation, which allowed me to sail a boat with no engine. I didn't have to be on time. Who cares? Right? And she was a wonderful boat. We had that boat for about 13 years. And uh, we sailed her everywhere, all through Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, all around here. She was a great boat. And then vacation ended. I'd have to go back to a ship. And then one day, this fellow eventually became my husband. We was in the very beginning part of our relationship the first couple of years, and he came to me and he said, you know, I want to buy this boat, uh, but we have to go look at it. It's in Queens. And at first I thought, this is really great. I met a guy who wants to, like, buy a boat and include me in his idea, you know. But I'm in Queens. Something's wrong with this picture. So we drive to Queens, and we went to... The, found the right address and you know every single house on the block was exactly the same and when we got to the door knocked on the door the guy said oh yeah the the, the boat's in the cellar in the closet <laughs> so I started having severe thoughts of second thoughts about my my life's mate choice <laughs> as it turns out he was brilliant this was a 1914 design a German kayak <laughs> and they disassemble, and you can put it in those bags. One bag has the parts of the frame, the other bag has the skin, the other bag has the sailing rig. And we invented a custom modified sailing rig for the boat. It's only 17 feet long. And we flew it to the Bahamas, hired a private plane to drop us into one of the most remote parts of the Bahamas and put the thing together and sailed uh, 80 miles through this island chain. See that tiny little boat there? 17 feet long, I think it was only 32 inches wide, and we had the time of our life. So th this boat, it taught me, I mean, it, it taught me A, to be open-minded about new boat ideas, um, and second of all, it taught me that the amount of fun that you have with a boat is inversely proportional to its size. Because that's a cool little boat. I still have it in the cellar. <laughs> so we went to all these super remote places in the Bahamas, and while we were cruising around, we met all these fellows who were building and restoring their own boats. These were originally fishing smacks. Um, 
every island, part of the island pride is that each major island will have its own boat and they carry it to different places where they have regattas and the different islands race against each other. It's called the Family Island Regatta. But it was fascinating that, you know, here are these super poor people who had absolutely no money or no resources. I mean, look at those frames. That All those frames are cut with an axe, hand tools. And then they would just fare the outside of the frames, and who cares what was inside the boat? No, but that didn't really, you know, again, it was a whole new philosophy about a boat, you know, just you know, make it smooth where the planks go on and caulk it and keep the water out and, and sell it. We met a lot of really nice boat builders. And of course they thought we were sailing in from another planet too. You know, we'd sail up. <laughs> and they'd say, where are you coming from? And we said, oh, you know, the other island about eight miles away. He'd say, in that? You know? The whole idea of sailing a little tiny kayak is crazy. But the beauty of that boat <clears throat> is that it only drew about six or eight inches of water. So the Bahamas is just a, a labyrinth of sandbars and shallow places. So with the boat that only draws six inches of water, you can scoot right across, and you can go to all the best fishing places where nobody else can get to. And you know it's fun, because it's, we have sailing rig, and the rudder is controlled with foot pedals. <laughs> So you'd sit there with your feet to steer, kind of like steering a go-kart. You know, it's fun. But wet. <laughs> we didn't take a shower for, I don't know, three weeks or so. And uh, we had a lot of salty gear. So anyway, then I had to go back to another ship <laughs> to finance the next exploration. And we went to Brazil. And I have a Brazilian friend here who I swear I searched my, there's nothing that makes you feel older than going through 40 and 50 years of photographs, okay? Looking for a trip that we did in Brazil in the early 80s. Uh, this was, these boats came, this is the only Brazil photograph I could find. A cool little tiny town that was sort of the working class version, maybe you've heard of Buzios. It's a very wealthy place outside Rio de Janeiro. Uh, all the famous movie stars hung out in Buzios, and the rest of us would hang out in Cabo Frio. And then from there, we went all the way up the coast. We sailed on jangadas, which are basically uh, fishing log canoes that are, they take logs, put them side by side, and drift them together with long pins, and these big, tall rigs sail out through the surf. Uh, so I, I love fishing in these indigenous places with these cool old boats because it really teaches you a lot about uh, ingenuity. Meanwhile, back on the ship. So you're starting to see the trend, right? <laughs> Little small boats uh, at home in big ships and lots of adversity at sea. Uh, we had a really good friend who bought a beautiful old lobster boat and turned it into a yacht. And we just fell in love with that style. And <clears throat> we went everywhere with this boat. We took it to Maine and we used it around here. And it was just the coolest boat. Um, that's Valdez. The oil comes by gravity across the mainland, 800 miles, and they put it in those tanks on the top of the hill. And then by gravity, it flows downhill onto the ships. I mean, so much friction in the pipelines that when the oil comes on the ship, even though it's three degrees south of the Arctic Circle, it's cold. It's 100, over 100 degrees. <laughs> Any ice and frozen things on the ship would just melt because the oil is you know, so hot from traveling the pipeline. So this is the boat that we bought. It's not a lobster boat, but it was a Long Island built boat, a Verity skiff built by Tom Verity in Baldwin Harbor. I think there might only be two or three of these boats left. And we did exactly the same thing. We were inspired by our friend's boat. We <clears throat> completely gutted the whole boat, cleaned it up. It was really a fishing boat. It smelled bad. And it had 
like a blue window or after a carpet stapled to all the frames. That was pretty horrible. But we cleaned it all up and put beautiful upholstery on it and turned it into a nice little weekend boat. She's uh, almost 70 years old right now. And we eventually, that's the thing about these old boats. They, they have friends and they have a life. It's, it's, uh, it's not like a production boat where you, it, it, to me a fiberglass production boat is like having a relationship with the inside of my refrigerator. I don't have any connection to it. It came out of a factory built by anonymous people. These old wooden boats, you know who built them, you know who cared for them, you know what their family members experienced on board. So we had this boat for several years and we explored all of this place with it. Every time we'd go out locally, uh, somebody would follow us and take our picture and finally we just throttled back one day and say, who are you? <laughs> he said, oh, I just love that boat and I, I just, if you ever, ever, ever want to sell that boat, please call me. And he turns out we did sell him the boat eventually. He became a very good friend. And then, I don't know, maybe 20 years went by or so, and he had to turn the boat over to somebody else. So he called me and he said, I had this idea. Why don't we own Mandalay together? By then, after my, our use of the boat, his use of the boat, add 20 more years, it was ready for another restoration by this point. So we invited a young boat builder from New Hampshire to go into a three-person partnership where Peter and myself put the capital in and the boat builder put his time in. So Mandalay is now in the barn in New Hampshire being restored and she'll be back soon, I hope. Just about that same time I got invited to sail on the Eagle. And um, I think I flew to Florida and joined the Eagle in Mayport, Florida, the naval base there, and we sailed it to New London. That was really a big experience for me because I had never sailed on a tall ship before. And <coughs> the Eagle has steel spars. She's almost 300 feet long, 200 and, I don't know, 87. I don't know. Um, but the rig is so top heavy that when you're motoring, you can feel it. Whew, whew, you know, that heavy weight up there. But that was a great uh, experience. And Captain Papp, who was the skipper of the Eagle at that time, went on to be the National uh, Commandant of the Coast Guard in Washington, so he was a big wheel. He's a cool guy. <coughs> That's the eagle on her fiddlehead. Very unusual perspective. It's from taken from the bowsprit, right straight down the stem. It's me on the end of the bowsprit. Yeah, the eagle had, I think, five sister ships. Uh, they were built in Germany, and at the end of the war, they were taken as war reparations. They gave one to the United States, that was the Eagle, and four others, I forget, Brazil maybe got one of them, right? Uh, Poland, I think, I, I really don't remember, Romania, I don't know, I should have done my homework, I forget, but, um, and one went to England. And the English decided that they would take theirs out and use it for target practice. That's how strongly they did it. <coughs> But over the years, I spent 17 years working on these ships, uh, mainly because I was in love with the work one day, get one day free at home idea. And it really suited my lifestyle. And I had a very uh, a good husband who kind of took care of everything for me when I was at sea, so I didn't have to worry about anything. I never did figure out how to become a mother. That's my only regret. <coughs> I mean, I do know women who had a child and then left it behind, and when that caught a ship, but I couldn't leave a baby behind for three months. I just wasn't my cup of tea. This is in Singapore. We would often bring ships to the shipyard in Singapore, and I spent four months in Singapore. <laughs> a lot of really interesting old work boats. I don't know what Singapore is like now, but this was in the middle 80s, I would guess, 1986 or 1987. And after spending three months in the shipyard, I flew to Jakarta because I heard about this harbor called Sunda Galapa. Um, 
Indonesia is a, island, a nation of islands. I think they have two or 3,000 different islands. And all the inter-island cargo uh, from these really poor islands goes on these working sailing cargo ships. And as you see, there's like no technology. I mean, they load them by hand, they walk on those skinny little planks. It's fascinating. And there weren't too many cars there. Everything happened by these little wherries. And they're looking over their shoulder at me because they thought for sure I was a prostitute. <laughs> aren't too many women, you know, going around looking at boats. Everywhere, everybody came alongside. Hey, mama, mama. <laughs> Crazy, right? Those two things sticking down, those are the rudders. They're nothing but giant oars, one on each side. And that's the latrine, that square thing hanging off the back of the ship. Direct deposit. <laughs> so you see, it's fascinating. And for people who love working craft, I mean, it was just a fascinating place. And then I took a train across Java uh, and explored most of the big island in Yogyakarta out on the eastern end, and then I flew to Bali. And uh, once you get off the southern coast of Bali, that's kind of where all the tourists are, mainly Australian partiers on the southern coast, the northern coast and the east side of the island are very remote and very beautiful. And these guys were sailing these uh, multi holes Basically, it's a dugout canoe with pontoons for stability. And they have to sail out through that breaking reef to go fishing. So these are the father and son, the guys that I went fishing with. And it's pretty fascinating because the boats are all just held together with things they find on the beach, found materials. Even the sails are made out of like blue tarps and grain sacks. <coughs> there it is. But that's, that's Indonesia for you. Everywhere you go, particularly in Bali, you know, there's beauty in every single thing. Every physical thing that you touch or see has some kind of expression built into it. <laughs> That's what's holding the mast up. Those are, those are the shrouds holding the, the mast. And I don't know, maybe you don't know what that is. That's called a Spanish windlass, where you put a stick in between the twisted rope and you crank like this. And the more you crank, the tighter it gets. And when it's just at the right tension, you lay the stick up against something, and it locks it in that tension position. It's fascinating. The ship that I was on also went to Rotterdam, Marseille, Southampton, Trieste, big deep water tanker ports. So I had the keys to my friend's houseboat in Amsterdam. So whenever I'd get off a ship in Rotterdam, I'd go visit him. And he, he also had a farm in Horn. And we spent, every time I got off a ship and hung out with him, we'd go all around the countryside looking at these restored chalks. That's what these sailing cargo boats are called. And almost all of them are restored into the yachts now. Beautiful lifestyle. See the cattle grazing right in the background. And that's a marina. I think it's very charming. And I had a friend who had a narrow boat in London. Uh, the narrow boat boats were built for the canal tr cargo transport just inshore of the Thames. So they're seven feet wide and 60 to 65 feet long. <laughs> it's fun. It's like, it's like cruising on a railroad car. That's about the shape of them. And there's only one way to get to the bow. You can either run along the top like James Bond, or you could go down the scuttle and run inside the whole accommodation space to get to the bow. Crazy. And you go to those, those little tunnels, you have to, almost all of them, people live on board. They have house plants, they have deck furniture, they, so you lay everything down so you can go through the canal. That was the class that I was on towards the end. I was on that class of ship for three years. Very big ship. 1,000 feet long, 264 feet of water loaded, 
166 foot beam. So, you know, that's the way of the world. The technology just kept getting, kept getting bigger and bigger and more complex. And that ship was so big, we used to ride bicycles to go to the bow. Because <laughs> it would take forever to walk all the way up there. And uh, I, I retired from, that was my last ship, I retired in 97. And the main reason that I retired is that I had a bad case of Lyme disease, stage two Lyme disease. And I was on an IV for 10 months. And nobody really knew what it was until uh, I had my, I was really lucky, I had a great doctor who did a spinal, drew a spinal uh, fluid sample, and it was loaded. <laughs> So that made my insurance company have to pay attention and I solved the problem. Anyway, that ended my career, 1997. And Earl and I uh, joined some friends. We sailed transatlantic on the 50-footer because we had, Earl particularly, had never done much offshore at the time. And we left from St. John's, Nova Scotia and sailed to Falmouth, England in 11 days. It was a very Challenging passage. There's a lot of wind, and we went fast. And then we decided that we wanted a big cruising boat that we could live on board and pretty much. We, we were living, at that time, we were living on Northwest Creek in East Hampton, and we started questioning the fabulous Hamptons growing all around us. And we sold our house and bought this boat, restored it, same deal, gutted the whole thing, started all over again, new wiring, new plumbing, new tanks, new everything. And she's a wonderful boat. I've had her for 20 years. And we moved to Greenport. That's my backyard right there. The boat lives right in the backyard. So we put a lot of miles on that boat. We went back and forth to the Bahamas. We went all over the place. We we, had, we put all our house stuff in storage and we lived on board for about a year and a half. And it was a good, it was a good lifestyle for us. You know, that turquoise is addictive. <laughs> it's so unbelievably calming and surreal. So, you know, this was the same place that we had explored many, twice we did that trip in the kayak, the whole chain. And we said, gee, I wonder what it's like to be on one of those big sailboats. So we went there ourselves with the room. That's the second dinghy we keep on, on deck. So we have the inflatable with an upboard for going and doing chores, and then we have the little sailing dinghy for pleasure. And these are the racing smacks that I showed you pictures of before where the guys are storing them on the beach. This is in Georgetown, Great Exuma, <clears throat> and now they come by cargo ship. Everybody sails to Nassau and they load all these little boats on a deck, as deck cargo on a ship and bring it to Georgetown. They're, it's just unbelievable. The masts are twice the length of the boat, the booms are, you see, it's just a massive amount of sail. And we happened to have our boat tied up to the dock while across the dock while these guys were working on trying to get this boat rigged and ready for racing. So first we started lending them tools and then helping them fix things. And before you know it, I was splicing lines and doing the best I could. And, and, and it only took like two days and they're like, do you want to sail with us? So that was a quite unusual for them to ask a woman to sail with them. So that's me with the crew. And they're incredible boats. Extremely powerful. They, uh, they have different size mainsails, light air, heavy air. They sail with loose ballast. So depending on how much wind there is, the crew will shift lead into or out of the boat. The only rule is you must return with the same amount of people you cross the starting line. Because <laughs> when it blows hard, I mean, they, they hike out on these pry boards. They sit on these boards that are hiking, hiking boards. It's crazy. 
but very beautiful, very old fashioned. And when I first started going to the Bahamas in the early 70s, you'd wake up at, at night, you know, in the middle of the night, and you'd hear this, you know, it's the guys at 4 o'clock in the morning raising these giant sails. They didn't have engines. So they'd sail out of the harbor, you know, come back three or four days, filled with conks, the whole deck, a big mountain of conks on deck. And now they're just used for racing. Um, around 2006, I can't remember exactly when that was, I was invited to sail uh, on the European Antique and Classic Yachting Circuit on Dolphin, who is a very famous local boat. She's a, she's a Nat Hershoff 1914 design. And <clears throat> we shipped her there on a ship. And she lived, she lived in France at a dock. And then we raced her in Spain and uh, France and Italy. And it was incredible. Not only is she a, a wonderful, fast boat, and you know, I'm not really the kind of person when I'm traveling to, you know, tell everybody, oh, I'm American, you know. <laughs> but I was very proud to be on a dock. The only boat with an American ensign was Dolphin out of 80 or 90 boats. And it was I just felt so good about being an ambassador, you know, for America with Matt Hershaw. Anyway, she's cool boat. She's still going strong. That's her. <coughs> but when you're racing in that in those regattas, you know, this is the way these boats you want to see them underway. You want to see them being sailed because they just don't look the same when they're tied into the dock. They're, they're still gorgeous, but when you see them racing, it's just incredible. And of course, we're talking about this is the 1% that only these boats. They have 25, 30 guys in crew, you know, mega, mega wealthy people. It's pretty exciting. And we won our class and our, uh, our division. And the uh, <coughs> trophy, the reception, the awards party was held at this big fort. And King Juan Carlos gave us our trophy. I got to meet the king. <laughs> Thank you, sorry. <laughs> anyway, we moved to Greenport in 2007, mainly because the boats in Greenport are better than the boats on the South Fork. <laughs> The food is better, the boats are better, it's still an authentic place. Uh, there's five marine railways still working in Greenport, and I, I, I need to be around people who are working boats and boats on the grid. And East Hampton wasn't that at all. That's also in my backyard, that's a big work boat right at the, on the adjacent dock. So there's you know, there's marine commerce everywhere you turn in Greenport. There are two boat building shops. This is Langdon Dolls and Son. Um, they do an awful lot of custom work. They restore boats mainly. And this is Wooden Boat Works. Wooden Boat Works probably has 20 or 25 guys on staff now. They have a facility in Akabog, Southhold, and Greenport. That big building, the red one there, is a marine railway. So <clears throat> one at a time, these boats come in. They get spa treatment all winter. It's a heated railway, insulated. And then when the paint job is done, the varnish is perfect. They slide it back out. It gets a fleece-lined canvas cover. They put it back in its winter berth. And then the next one goes in all winter long. These are fine antiques, these boats. They're not just boats. They're expensive, beautiful pieces of art. Both of those two boats, the black one and the white one in the foreground, are 114 years old, 1905. This is a brand new build. Um, she, she's a 1930 William Fife 8 meter. So it's funny because People think that the working waterfront doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> it, no one's fishing, and you know they're not renting rowboats anymore. But this is the new working waterfront. 
Again, it's art. This owner had two boats built. One wasn't enough. He wanted to have a second one exactly cloned after the first one so they could race, race against each other. Two million dollars a piece. That's the, uh, the top of the rudder and the tiller. So as you can see, it's just unbelievably over the top, exquisite deck jewelry. So that's what's going on in Greenport and we're getting word from. And then <clears throat> in, when we first got to Greenport, you know, they had a maritime festival. It's a little bit like Harbor Fest in Sack Harbor, but bigger marina takes over the whole town. And I was at a meeting about this size and I stood up in the back and I said, where's the maritime in the maritime festival? Because <laughs> it was a lot of vendors and tchotchkes and funnel cake vans and all that stuff. And somebody very smartly put me right in, the, in my place and said, well, what can you do to help us? <laughs> So I said, oh, okay. Uh, and I came up with this idea to have a classic boat rendezvous. So every year during the Maritime Festival, about 20 boats, we bring them in from all over the East End, South Fork included. We fill the park with beautiful handmade and hand restored boats. Uh, and we fill two whole docks with boats in the water so that people can see that these boats, uh, you know, this is, uh, our, our livelihood is alive and well. This guy restores Chris Graffs. He's in Kajok. Beautiful, beautiful work. And people love it. You know, people will come and spend hours just pouring over the boats, looking inside, feeling the varnish and the upholstery. It's cool. So I did that for nine years. Finally, I uh, found somebody to take it over for me. So now I don't do that anymore, but I, I got it going. These are Gil Smith uh, catboats from Great South Bay. They're also yachts. And then when I was at the Shelter Island Historical Society, the Yacht Club was, Shelter Island Yacht Club was having its 125th anniversary. And I thought, well, what could we do to celebrate, you know, that's a really old Yacht Club, 1886, 1888. So they have a big class. They have 60 12 and a half. That was another one of Elf, um, Nat Hershoff's boats. Again, 1914 design. So we found a beautifully built original boat, brought it in the barn, beautiful 40 by 60 foot barn, put it on a cradle, lit it with halogen lights like a piece of sculpture. And then I wrote a whole story of the origin of the design, where it came from, where the idea came out of, who built them, how the class becomes, became so popular. And it was a wonderful tribute. Sort of not the kind of thing that most people would bring to a historical society, because I remember the members of the board of directors were like, why do we want to like focus on the Yacht Club? <laughs> so I had to explain to them that you know, there's more to life than just an old house museum and mason jars and rug beaters, you know. I mean, it's incredible that the maritime focus, because I think everybody drives their car everywhere, they don't think about a maritime history, but it's an incredibly rich history around here. Anyway, that was a fun exhibit. So, I lost my voyaging adventurer partner in 2013. So it's kind of hard to run a big boat by yourself, you know? So then I like, really had some soul searching to do. Do I want to stay home? Do I want to keep doing this? Do I, you know, how can I be involved with boats as a widow? But that, anyway, it was really, I did some soul searching about it and realized that there are a lot of young women out there who would love to have somebody help train them become captains. So that was kind of what I decided to do. Um, I've gone through four, cap four young women captains now. This is the first one. She came to Greenport. She was a rigger. She had worked on, on tall ships. 
she said she really wanted to not just work on these boats, but she wanted to become a captain, and she, so I said, okay. So I helped her get her license. I helped train her. She ran boats for me. She now is working on some super yacht somewhere in, I don't know, another hemisphere. So she, she, she did great. Uh, that's her boyfriend, Eric. We brought, uh, our boat surprise, we brought her all the way up the Rio Dulce River in Guatemala, way up into the rainforest and those freshwater lakes. We did some cool, exciting trips together. And then this is Jesse, who uh, came to me uh, as a summer intern from the Harbor School in New York. It's a charter school on a Governor's Island, and that's what they do. They train kids for different kinds of maritime um, occupations. And she's, she's something else, I kid. And this is my goddaughter, Luna. She's now my present captain. She was on the boat for seven months with me two years ago. And it's interesting, when she first came on the boat, she, uh, you know, she was just really a kid, kind of half-baked ideas about how the world worked. And we went to Cuba, we went to the Bahamas, we went all over the place. And before, by the time that winter was over, she was a hunter, she could catch lobsters, she could go to fish, she, I mean, she really came together. She understood about sustainability and growing sprouts on board and, you know, how to live off the grid. <coughs> and last, around Christmas time last year, she called me and she said she wanted to get her license. So she did, and now she's running the boat. She's only 20, she turned 21 yesterday. Is oh. that tattoo on her arm? Yes. <laughs> we were in Havana, and she and Jesse decided they wanted to get tattoos. And I'm like, oh my God. I mean, I'm not a mother, but I'm like, you better check in with your parents first. And that was very sketchy. That's the beginning of, it's hard to see the way she has it there. It's the beginning of a telephone pole, if you've ever been to Havana. It's like unbelievable that the electricity works there. But anyway, we did it. Is that the final tattoo that uh, it's, it's, no, she's changed it. It's added, been added on to it. It goes around, it's hard to see because it's behind her head, but it goes all the way around her arm. Anyway, a telephone pole. I'm like, are you sure that's what you want to have on your body when you're 40? You still want to be telling the same story? And she said, yeah. Are you judging me? I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> So this is Guatemala. Uh, there's a big freshwater river. You, you have to cross this really shallow sandbar to get there. And then you go almost 100 miles up to the next big city. It's right on the edge of the jungle. And it's a pretty incredible place. All dug out canoes. Uh, there's not too much going on up there. There are a few NGOs that have set up these like, education centers for indigenous people, whoops. And there's no car, there are no roads, so there are obviously no cars. Everybody goes by boat. And when we would anchor, people would come out and you know, they have nothing. They, they grow bananas and they have a few chickens and they grow corn and catch fish in the river and that's pretty much all they need. So they would come out and trade. You know, woman would come out with a little tiny bag with maybe three or four eggs in it. You know, we'd trade for some special treat we have. Um, these are fishing smacks in Belize, and it's it's hard to see in this photograph because it's not really. You know, I scanned old paper photographs, and it's not a great job. But if you can see, there are four or five. somewhere, hand line for fish, and we always had extra chocolate bars and things like that, so we'd get in the dinghy and row over there. Trade. 
So we didn't have to fish, we just got it from heaven. This is Cuba. And it's incredible that all these tiny little ports in Cuba, you know, the Cubans are also a very poor country. They don't have any resources to build boats. They don't have proper paint or caulking or sealants or anything. So they make these boats by hand and they, they look like it. But they, you know, keeps the water out. I mean, really, it's that's the threshold. You have to float. This guy came out to the boat and decided he was going to be our guide. <laughs> I mean, we looked like royalty on a, you know, mine was not even a fancy yacht, but to them it looked like a really fancy yacht. So he came out, and the Spanish that he spoke was so mysterious, nobody could figure out what he was saying. And he tied up behind the boat, and he helped us through this incredibly difficult mangrove passage. And we gave him some spices and some sugar and stuff. Look at that boat, right? So this is my boat. Helicopter shot. And this is this is how uh, I stay connected with these class of boats now. My my company, I'm a booking agent for ten beautiful yachts. People want a special party, they want an anniversary celebration. On the North Fork, we do a lot of wedding work because there's 150 vineyards and a lot of weddings going on over there. So people call me and I try to listen to what they want and put them on just the perfect yacht. She's in Sag Harbor, 1929. How long is that? She's 80 feet. And you know, the good part about this kind of work is that it keeps these old girls going. And you can imagine what the maintenance budget is. The people who own this boat, they're not wealthy people. They just are devoted to maintaining this art form. So the boat works, and it pays for her budget, and it keeps her going strong. <laughs> That's what I mean about the North Fork. There's no shortage of oysters and good local food. So um, I just try to create joy and put people on the right boat. A lot of families. And you know, it's interesting that the East End, about a third of the geography is an open space. And a lot of the places that we bring people on boats, you can't even drive to. If you, even if you have a four-wheel drive vehicle, you can't get there. So we try to show them what, what it used to be like here how pure and serene and clean it is when you get away from the crowds. And they come back and it, it transforms them. <laughs> this is my friend's 1930 antique. It used to be an Olympic class canoe, sailing canoe. So anyway, as you see, there's, there's never, never enough boats. There's always something interesting. So thank you so much for coming and doing an old-fashioned slideshow. <laughs>
still not fast, but you know, more comfortable than you know, could be more comfortable than a sailboat. Yeah. So just wondering. I see you have a king. I, yeah. I have a brand new name myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I totally relate to what you're talking yeah, about. I it's uh, <laughs> you know, sailing there it's challenging. Anchoring is more difficult, uh, there's not as much automation. You know, you just have to do some soul searching and figure out what you really want. And, you know, as a couple, I would say that the, the lore of a trawler makes so much more sense because you spend more time enjoying each other instead of struggling with all the lines and rigging. And I know, but like, yes, they were out in Thunder's Bay and it was like, you know, we shut the engine off and, you know, and, and it was empty. You know, we went out, we go out like four or five o'clock. I was just absolutely gorgeous. And I, I said to my wife, I said, there's nothing like listening to that water, you know, lap against the boat, the wind on the sails. And that's why it's like, you know, yeah. it just. Sounds to me like you need a motor sailor. And, and, you know, motor sailors have fallen out of fashion in today's society because we have gotten so accustomed to specializing. Right. But in the 60s and the 70s, a motor sailor made sense. You have a boat with a tall rig, it sails really well. But when you need the engine, you've got a big, powerful engine and a nice crop, and you know, you get down to business and get home on time. You know, it's it's a, it's a tough decision. Yes. Thank you. Uh, what are you going to do with the Betty Lou once it's I think she's just going to be like a cocktail cruiser. You know, a couple of liquor chairs in the cockpit, and gentle, easy, uh, flat water sailing. Nothing extravagant. I, well, I, yeah, keep it in the framework. Yeah. I do. I have some in my purse. Yeah. Pat, why do they call boats a she? I think history belongs to those who write it. <laughs> and, you know, guys, you know, there are all these myths about. Having a craft between your legs, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Driving the boat, you know, and she's going to take care of you, the whole nurturing maternal thing. And I, I really don't know. I, I'm sure there's a probably somebody a lot smarter than me has a better explanation, but I just really think that people started saying that because guys were talking about them all the time and not women. Most boats, I, you know, there's a few boats I call he because. You know, a stalwart, you know, boat doesn't really seem like a she. Yeah. But. Wait, do you live on a boat now? No, I have a house. I live in a house. Yeah. My house has a dock right in the back. <coughs> oh, when you say your backyard and I'm looking at water and I'm thinking, oh, maybe she lives I live on, on water. on Sterling Basin in Greenport. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And all, everybody on my street, every house has a dock, so oh. they're all private. The people, the boats come first, the house comes second. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. After you left Fort Schuyler, did you have any obligation to to ship out, you know, to for the, for the uh, I I was supposed to accept a naval commission because I took a federal subsidy, and you know, all those naval reserve ships are manned by merchant mariners doing their inactive duty time. But I really had a hard time. I didn't really want to be in the Navy. So when it came time to do my medical exam, I probably should have done this in public, but there were seven or eight pages of questionnaires to fill out. And one of the questions said, do you walk in your sleep? And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I got out of it. And you know, they called me back, and I was so embarrassed. that I, Oh, Miss Mundus, we're so sorry to inform you that we're not going to be able to accept you. <laughs> 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 yeah. How do you go? How did you go about getting the jobs on the big ships? I worked. I worked directly for a corporation. They recruited me actually because they were trying to get women on ships, and they hired 55 third mates that year and. One of them was a woman, that was me. So in those days, there was only maybe four or five percent women on ships total. I'm talking about all the way from the people that clean the bedrooms to the cooks to the to the mates. Yeah. So there were very few of us. 
I don't think there's that much larger percentage today, maybe 8 or 10 percent at the most. And it's interesting to me that they sent a woman, you know, to outer space before they made her a capital <laughs> so Very slow process. Tradition. Were you ever in a, like a hurricane storm on one of those big ships? Yeah. And, and, and how did it handle the... The whole month of November is like a hurricane <laughs> when you're going to Alaska. Because it's 3,000 miles from Japan to the northwest coast. So that's a long way for those big tight, mean lows to develop and start pushing seas. So you just go slow. You just pick your heading and you just barely keep the bow, just seas right off the bow, and you go slow. I mean, it would normally take four or five days to get to San Francisco, and sometimes it would take 10 or 12 days. Just go slow. The scariest thing that ever happened was an earthquake, and we didn't know what it was. <laughs> It just, we were 30 miles from a 6.7 earthquake in the Gulf of Alaska, and the whole ship just started pounding up and down. We didn't know what it was. We thought a blade fell off the propeller, and it just rattled the Jesus out of the ship. I mean, it broke everything. All the overhead panels came down, doors flew off. I mean, it was incredible. We had a lot of damage. We had uh, the bulkhead between the fore peak and the first cargo tank. You know, Huge three-quarter inch steel bulkhead, right. cracked like this, wow. 14 feet long, Boop. just like that, right down the middle. Boop. I'm crazy. So yeah, and we so we stayed, spent the whole day shut down, damage control crew. We went over the whole ship with a fine-tooth comb, and we weren't leaking, and we didn't develop any cracks, but we had a lot of broken machinery, a lot of mounting brackets, and that sort of thing. So. We got to San Francisco, we were loaded. <clears throat> we got to San Francisco, we pumped all the cargo off, cleaned the ship, went to the shipyard, and the experts came down, and they surveyed the ship. They could see just by the damage, broken brackets, all the forces that come from the starboard side. So they were forensically able to recreate exactly where it was coming from, how far were we were away from it. It was very interesting. So we were kind of like a case study. Mm -hmm. Scary. Yeah. <laughs> Scary because everybody was in the same state of unknown. Yeah, nobody knew what it was. And did it lasted for about three minutes. I guess. It would seem like forever. Did the captain keep his or her cool with the captain? Everybody was like, what? And then the only reason that we clued into what it was was that a f few minutes afterwards, another ship few miles away made an announcement on the VHF radio. It said, stand clear, we have a fire in the engine room and we're experiencing excessive vibration. As soon as he said excessive vibration, I'm like, oh my god, you're ready to tell me. Yeah. So, you know, you can easily understand how ancient cultures you know, would develop a myth to explain strange weather phenomena because it's totally like so much bigger than you and so unknown, un unknowable. Oh, thank you. Thank you.